Krav is a, a spiritual, uh, mental, and health development system, martial art, that really its origins are lost in antiquity. No one really knows when it, when it began. But pretty much it became systematized around 2,000 to 1,500 years ago. Before that, it was loosely handed down through families, and a lifetime was spent training in the system, and then handed down again. It was natural. There weren't any schools, let's say, or temples where it was learned. But since the um, influx of the Christians and the Romans into Northern Europe, um, those really turbulent European years, the system was seen to be under decline, so they started to condense it, systematize it. Now it's actually in a training format, although it's not as extensive as uh, Asian martial arts in its actual curriculum, still relying on principles. About 1,200 years ago, it went through a major revamp. The runes came down from about 32 runes to 16, what we call the Junger Futark, and Stav was now based upon the Junger Futark, the 16 runes. So um, it's about, who knows how old, I'm the 45th generation inheritor of the system uh, since it's been counted, before that things weren't counted. So the basic training weapon of this system, Stav, uh, for the past few thousand years has been the axe, because everybody had axes. You had to be able to fell trees to work in those days. Stav, uh, stav actually means staff, and it also stands esoterically for the spine, which is the center staff of the human, um, which uh, we use when we do our breathing practices and meditation and so on. So the training weapon was the axe for the attacking weapon, because that was the common weapon to be found. And in the old days, it was the spear, which would be a staff of about this length or a bit more with a nice spearhead on it. So that was the basic weapon, which gave you the lines and taught you how to uh, know the correct distance, timing, and line, and how to change time. And then based on that basic training, you would then move into whatever weapon applied to what particular class that you belonged to. So the um, lowest class people, the trail people, they couldn't really afford anything, so they'd have a walking stick or a cudgel, the old shillelagh. Like when the British came in and took over Ireland, they wouldn't allow the Irish to carry any bladed weapons anymore. So the Irish moved back to the blackthorn walking stick and the shillelagh. And uh, they did a good number on the British with the blackthorn walking stick and the shillelagh. So even though we consider it a lower class weapon, by no means is it any less effective against a sword or anything else if you know what you're doing. The next class is the Carl class, the free man class, the independent businessman and farmer, and they would have the ax because that was the common uh, tool that they were working with all day long. So that was their most common weapon. That's why we use it for the cuts. The next weapon at the Hesha, the warrior class, was what we call the Skrama socks, and it's a short sword, the blade of which comes from about here to here. And there would be a handle. It's not a double-handed sword, it's a single-handed sword. Double-handed sword in European history was only used for a short period and mostly to hoe down the spear phalanxes that were coming at the two sides in these large wars. So you'd try to take the head off the spear coming at you, then from behind, your guys would come through with the short swords and then duel it out. So the real warrior class weapon is this short sword, and they'd often have that with an even shorter knife on their belt and be battling through, sometimes with a wooden shield. And then the next level was the uh, priest class, and we would use uh, this kind of staff, long walking stick, something like this. Also the bow and arrow, the long bow. That was also because the bow was used to be plucked to make a sort of background music for the uh, altered states of consciousness work that the priest class people would do as well. Kind of like the birum bow for capoeira is what I always think of when I, I think about our tradition. It's similar in that way. We would do something called galder, chanting. And um, the last class, the Kunga class, was represented by the spear as the ultimate weapon there. And, um, also the walking stick, as I said later in history, when the spearhead became less in vogue to carry around on the streets. Okay, and that's because uh, that class relates to Odin, the main god of the Norse system, who was like crazy wise, and he was a wanderer. He was always seeking. So he had his stick, his walking stick, that he would always be traveling around with. The origins of Stav, as far as uh, where it came from, is quite fascinating. In Europe, 50 to 100,000 years, maybe even longer than that, we had a matrifocal culture, uh, a culture based around the feminine. There was no warrior class in all the archaeological digs that were done. There was no weapons ever found. It was very peaceful. And then you had an Indo-Aryan influx coming up from, who knows, this is under great conjecture in the, the, the world of science, but they say usually from somewhere around northern India, uh, maybe the Slavic areas, there was this movement westward and northward of a very warlike people, patriarchal people, the chariot, the horses, and so on. And they had more of a structured approach to life and to society. Well, they brought with them the warrior arts. The blend that occurred in Stav is the matrifocal uh, spiritual arts blended with the patriarchal spiritual and warrior arts, and we ended up with Stav. So 
we can say that Stav is not a purely Indo-Aryan uh, Celtic type of martial art, um, but that it is a, a system that incorporated both the pre-Celtic, the matrifocal goddess era uh, wisdoms, and the post-Celtic invasion wisdoms as well. So it really relates quite a lot, you'll see, to the Indo-Aryan system of the classes or the castes from India you can see today. In Stav, the difference I see is that from my studies with the Indian system where it's degenerated in India now, is that each class or caste sees themselves as a separate entity, um, even where you have the untouchables who no one even wanted to deal with. In the Nordic regions, in the Germanic regions, the classes were interdependent. There was no idea that one could exist without the other. The highest wouldn't even function without the lowest because they did all the work. And in return, the warrior class and nobility classes would then give protection and food and all the rest uh, and technical skills and knowledge to the people who were doing the grunt work. So it was seen as very interconnected and interdependent. And a lot of the ceremonies during the year uh, reflected that. There wasn't this segregation. Everybody was together.